to talk about consolidated planning, annual action planning, and a myriad of federal funding sources, which are outlined on the slide. We have our community development block grant program, our home investment partnerships program, and our emergency solutions grant. We live in a world of acronyms here, so we are going to use those acronyms throughout the course of the presentation. Um, and I did want to preface this with, um, there, we're going to be throwing a lot of information at you this evening. We're going to do our best to try and keep the presentation as high level as possible, taking into consideration that the total page count for the plans that are currently available for public comment is 376 pages. So we're not going to be able to get into all of the um, nitty gritty granular level details this evening. We are really focusing on providing a high level of information and there will be information later in the PowerPoint related to how you can get in touch with us. Teresa can also get you in touch with um, any of us that present here this evening. And um, I do also want to note that we are district advisory board hopping this evening. So after this presentation, we're going to hop off this one, hop onto the virtual meeting invitation for District 6. Um, and so we would love to engage in meaningful conversation with you, hear your feedback and your comments related to the plan. Um, but just keeping in mind that we do have another district advisory board that we have to get to and that we would love to have further conversations with you if we can't address everything this evening. So just to provide a high level of how we're going to split the presentation up this evening. I'm going to kick it off and then introduce our con consultants from WFN um, who will provide information related to who they are, their firm, as well as provide you high level information related to what is a consolidated plan, what is an annual action plan, um, what is an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, and then dive into specifics related to our specific consolidated plan, what we are proposing for our high-level priority needs, high-level goals for the next five-year period, and provide you some context related to how we got there, talking about the different phases of consolidated planning um, and how we took consultations and um, interviews with stakeholders and interviews with city staff and used it to develop a high-level five-year strategic plan for the use of these three federal entitlement grant program dollars. Then after WSN finishes up that part of the presentation, they're going to kick it back to us, city staff, to walk you through specific funding allocations for our first program annual action plan. So consolidated plan covers a five-year period. Annual action plans cover each individual year within that five-year consolidated plan period. Um, and I think that's all I really have to say right now. Again, thank you for your time. I'm going to kick it over to WFN. Teresa, if you could advance to slide three, please. Is that the correct one, Logan? Maybe it's slide four. Slide four, okay. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm Erica Fambro. I know we came out um, earlier, well, late last fall um, and met with your group. Um, and so we're back now. We've um, had an opportunity to go over the research, um, look at the plans, uh, develop those plans. Oh, okay, this is where we should be. Um, develop those plans. And uh, so like Logan said, we're going to go through um, the, the two planning documents that we worked on and then uh, give you some just a high level view of uh, some of the, um, I'm sorry, some of the uh, priorities and the uh, impediments that were identified in the plan. So the planning documents that we're working on, um, like she said, were the consolidated plan and the annual action plan. And as Logan pointed out, the consolidated plan is a five-year plan that the city must uh, submit to HUD in order to receive their uh, annual dollar. Um, though that plan really gives the city uh, 
what what you're looking for when you're preparing that plan is really identifying those needs and then identifying the priorities uh, that uh, that the city is wanting to undertake over the next five years to address the needs that were identified uh, during this process. Um, that action plan, the action plan is a document that's prepared annually uh, by the city and it requires that uh, the city details out whatever projects and activities they're going to propose to use the funding on um, to address the uh, priorities and the goals that are identified in that five-year strategic plan. Um, so this action plan, it essentially serves as an application for funding um, for the Community Development Block Grant, the Home Investment Partnerships Program, and the Emergency Solutions Grant. So those are the three grant programs that we're covering. Um, CDBG is a pretty broad grant that talks about um, community development, um, some housing elements, um, some public and community service type activities. Um, and then if you'll go back to the last slide, sorry. Okay. And then uh, the Home Investment Partnerships Program is exactly what it sounds like. It's uh, all about housing. And then Emergency Solutions Grant, that one's uh, all about homelessness. Um, so the city receives funding in all three of these categories. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail, um, I believe in slide six, we'll start to talk about some of the uh, different uh, priorities and things like that. So you can go to next slide. Okay, the third document that we're working on or that we have worked on for the city was the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. That's a lot of words, um, but it's essentially a document that uh, the city must complete um, to identify barriers in uh, regarding fair housing um, and actions that the city can take to improve access to equitable fair housing. Um, and so this is a plan or a document or an analysis, if you will, that must be completed um, every five years. It's completed when the city is undertaking a five-year strategic plan known as the consolidated plan. Um, so they must, the city must take action to address the identified impediment and another word for impediment to be barriers. Um, so you address those um, impediments by promoting fair housing for all protected classes, uh, providing opportunities for racially and ethnically inclusive housing patterns. So you want to have people living in um, diverse communities and things like that. Um, identifying structural and systemic barriers to fair housing. Um, so are there rules or laws in, at play that uh, prevent certain people from living uh, where they would choose to live, um, barring income. So, you know, everything else equal, um, you know, income equal, can people live where they choose to live? Um, and then promoting ADA accessible housing. So that's uh, one of the biggest um, complaints that cities and counties receive is um, fair housing issues based on um, disability factor. Um, so we identified seven impediments during this process, and we'll get to that in just a bit. If you'll move to the next slide, please. Okay, so those, those impediments are um, discrimination in the rental market based on source of income. So what we're talking about here, um, if a person is receiving uh, Social Security or um, some sort of public subsidy. Um, landlords in the community have not been so favorable in uh, providing access to housing to uh, people that are um, using vouchers or people who are receiving public assistance um, as their source of income. So that's something that um, just needs to be taken a look at. And uh, we've identified some recommendations in the plan um, that we, we did not list them here on the screen, but we've identified some recommendations that can be undertaken. And not everything is undertaken by the city, um, but there are recommendations that we can um, start to, uh, to, to encourage in the community so that we make a better way 
for um, the residents. Um, the expense of tenant screening reports for low-income renters, um, housing affordability, cost burden. So this means that uh, there's a, a, a good majority, about 25% of people are paying more than 30% um, of their income for housing costs. Um, and that's something that we look at. And that's a marker that HUD identifies if you're paying more than 30% of your um, income for housing related expenses. So that includes your rent, that includes a mortgage, that includes um, utilities and things like that. If you're paying more than 30% of your income, they consider that cost burden. And there are some people that are paying more than 50% of their income um, in housing related expenses. Um, housing accessibility for disabled residents. So um, looking at those factors. Um, deficiency in fair housing education. So are, is the community educated about the fair housing, um, their fair housing rights and things like that? So we want wanted to look at that and we provided some recommendations for the city to be able to um, improve on providing that education to your landlords, to um, your property managers, to um, your lending community to just regular citizens who are seeking to access housing. Um, people need to know what their rights are. If you don't know your rights, you don't know they've been violated. So that's something um, that, that, was, uh, that we identified. And then um, underserved populations. So we're thinking about um, how, how is the city or how are your nonprofits, how are they serving communities like the homeless or disabled persons. Um, so that was one thing that was identified. And then public transportation and uh, infrastructure needs. So these were some, some impediments that were identified in that um, analysis. And uh, we offer some recommendations in the actual document that the city can undertake over the next five years. Um, some, some would require um, funding and some some doesn't require uh, funding. So ju just um, take a look at those in the actual plan. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Okay, so this process here, um, we've determined the needs, we've set the priorities, um, we've looked at the resources, we set some goals. So um, we're moving on, we're somewhere between number four and five at this point. Um, what will happen at this point, we get feedback from the community on the actual plan, the actual goals that were identified, the priorities that were identified. Um, the city will receive their funding from HUD um, sometime in the next couple of weeks or so. They'll have their allocation. Um, and then once, once the plan is um, once this 30 day comment period ends, uh, the, the city, I'm sorry, uh, the community services department will take this back to uh, council for approval. We'll submit it to HUD. Uh, once HUD approves it, then you'll start administering those programs. So all the programs and projects that Logan's going to outline in, a, in the later slides, um, all of that stuff happens in number five. Um, and once that, once the, once the programs start to happen, then we start to uh, evaluate the performance. So once you're running those programs, people are being served, money is being spent. The last step in that process is to evaluate the performance to ensure that, you know, the things that you decided to do, that they're working and that they are actually serving you know, legitimate clients who need help. Um, and so all of that stuff is identified in something that's called a CAPER. And that stands for the Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report. So that's a report that the city is required to do um, annually. Um, and it just really tells us how well you're meeting um, your criteria of the grants. You can go to the next slide. Let me ask a question now, or do you want to wait? 
Um, you can go ahead. Okay, simply put, is the right to know who your actual landlord is been brought up in any of your um, surveys and feedback? So the right to know who your landlord is. Who the actual landlord. Owner, the property owner. Yeah. Um, I've not seen that specifically, but I'm assuming that you may have people that have like property managers and then there's a separate owner. Is that what's happening? In the experience I recently was involved with, there was actually eight or nine companies before they actually got to who really owned the property. And henceforth, there was no accountability. And if that's right. not I won't worry about it. Yeah, I haven't seen that specifically, but I'm sure that could be a problem. And a lot of times it comes up um, as uh, absentee landlords. It doesn't necessarily, um, you know, people don't necessarily have a name for it. Um, so we could be talking about the same thing. So I'm glad you brought that up. And that's, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So right now, um, what we do um, and you probably saw this screen before, um, is what we call a phase planning process. Um, when we came out before, we were in phase one, and that was gathering community input, data collection, interviews, and all of that stuff, um, looking at you know actual hard data, empirical data that we look at, census data, those sorts of things. Um, we moved on into phase two. And so we've been um, working together with Logan and uh, Andrew trying to develop this plan and come up with workable solutions and things like that. And that, that's what happened in phase two. Now we're in phase three. So we've come up with some priorities. We've come up with some impediments. We've identified some goals. And now we're back uh, to uh, seek feedback from you all from the community. Um, so phase three, this includes us um, getting your feedback. It includes us making revisions to the plan uh, based on that feedback. And then um, just kind of moving into uh, getting the document prepared for um, approval by the council and submission to HUD. So when we think about um, this phase three part of the process, one of the things or few of the things we wanted to just kind of talk about, and they're not highlighted here on the screen, but I wanted to make sure that we gave you some uh, detail about that. Um, so the consultations that we did um, back in uh, the fall of last year and a few earlier this year um, really just kind of uh, revealed a few things. Um, we talk with nonprofits, we work with um, government agencies, um, city staff, uh, the continuum of care. So we've got information from just quite a few people, the general public as well. Um, so during this process, we had, I had some notes here. We had um, five general meetings, um, two virtual meetings with uh, stakeholders, one in-person meeting with stakeholders, um, two general meetings, one in-person and one uh, virtual meeting um, that occurred. And during those meetings, um, the, the, the biggest issue that was kind of central to every meeting was the increase in homelessness um, in the community. Um, everyone had something to say about the um, increased number of um, homeless persons that um, in the city um, and in particular, one of the things that came up often as well is that the age of the homeless person is increasing. Um, so they're seeing some senior homelessness, um, more families that are working families that are entering into homelessness. Um, maybe they're staying at a extended stay or sleeping in their car, things like that. Um, so those two things came up quite a bit as well when we talk about who that actual homeless person is. Um, 
we did see from from our last meeting with um, all of the DABs, there was some support for the multi-agency center that um, that idea has kind of been floating around. There was um, good support for that. Um, housing rehabilitation. This one um, was something that a lot of people were interested in and wanting to um, see the city continue and offering those types of programs. Um, that does allow people to age in place. It allows, you know, seniors who own their home to remain in their homes um, for years to come. Um, nothing worse than owning a home that you can't live in because it's, you know, not heated or something like that. So the housing rehab was a really, um, was something that came up quite a bit as well. Um, let's see here. The need for recreation centers and uh, activities programming for kids after school was something that um, came up also. Um, let's see. When we talk to stakeholders, um, in addition to all of the things that I just um, talked about the housing, the homelessness, the affordability issues um, with with housing. Um, the other thing that came up was um, programming for substance abuse and um, substance abuse and mental health services. So those were some things that came up quite frequently um, throughout the consultation process. And uh, we also did a survey. The survey, we had 442 respondents um, to the survey. So it's really good. Um, the city was very engaged in providing that feedback. Um, 442 responses. And the surveys kind of mirrored what we we're seeing um, in the consultation. So it wasn't just, you know, completely drastically different, which is good and which is what we want to see. Um, during a process like this. Um, so what we did, we came up with some priority that the city can um, kind of keep as an overarching priority for the next five years. And so if we'll go to the next slide, um, there are six priority needs um, that the city can kind of focus on, on over the next five years. So that's access to affordable housing, homelessness reduction, access to public services, non-housing community development. And we'll give you some detail about these, um, furthering fair housing, and then planning and administration. So if we'll skip to the next slide, we have some goals kind of listed under each of these priorities. And these are the things that um, the city will be able to undertake um, on an annual basis um, to make sure that we're meeting those priority needs. So under access to affordable housing, um, we have four goals listed here. Um, home repair for homeowners. And that's exactly what it sounds like. So repairing houses, um, doing those minor repairs. Maybe someone needs a, um, a roof repair. Maybe someone needs a water heater or something of that nature. Um, Home ownership assistance. So assisting people with becoming homeowners, um, providing that down payment assistance for them to um, assist them with uh, moving into a home ownership uh, phase of life. So that's good stuff. Um, financial assistance for affordable rental housing. So this would be like rental subsidies. This could be um, providing um security deposits to obtain a uh, permanent rental housing. So maybe a homeless person is needing a, um, a, a subsidy in order to move into, move out of homelessness and into permanent housing. Um, affordable housing development. So this would be building or constructing new housing um, for, um, for affordable, uh, for, for affordable clientele. So um, that's access to affordable housing, um, access to public services. So this is um, by far the most competitive part of the grant. And, and um, so this one includes things like um, your neighborhood resource centers. 
It includes things like um, any of the community service activities, the latch key program, things like that. This one, um, the city does put out an RFP annually to um, receive applications for this one. So it's competitive in that way. So people have to apply for these funds and um, go through a, an applications process, if that makes sense. Okay, and then homelessness reduction. So supportive for supportive services for the homeless. So this could be providing shelter. This could be um, those types of activities. And then financial assistance for affordable rental housing, just like under access to affordable housing, it's similar under this homelessness reduction category. It's providing those subsidies um, to families to either remain in their homes through something called homelessness prevention or to move into permanent housing through something called uh, rapid rehousing. So moving them directly from homelessness into permanent housing. Hey, Erica, do you yes. know how much is set aside for assistance for affordable rental housing? Yes, Logan's going to get into that on her slide. She's going to go through um, each of the activities that the city's set aside for the year. So we'll get into that in just a few slides. So if we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so the last three here, uh, non-housing community development. It's just what it sounds like. So when you think about the community, you might think about buildings, you might think about roads, things like that. So infrastructure improvement. Um, you know, this might be repairing a sidewalk or installing a sidewalk, um, blight reduction. So removing dilapidated housing within the community, um, acquiring public facility. So um, this could be, you know, acquiring a, a some sort of building that you're going to operate a public service activity out of and then human and public services. So that all kind of falls under that non-housing community development. So anything that's community development that's not related to housing will fall kind of under this category. Okay, and then affirmatively furthering fair housing, just as what it sounds like when we talked about, um, you know, providing education about your fair housing rights and things like that, that falls under this category. And then planning and administration. So that would be the program administration of the grant. So that is a, a bucket of funding that we have to um, set aside for um, Logan and her team to be able to <laughs> administer these programs. So um, I'll turn it back over to Logan for her to go through the action plan. Actually, Erica, it's going to be me. Um, oh, so sorry. That's okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, my name is Andrew Tyree. I'm with the Housing and Community Services Department. And as Logan mentioned earlier, we're going to, um, um, her and myself are going to go over the first year annual action plan. And this is going to be for program year 24-25. And just as a reminder, um, our program years aren't just like a regular calendar uh, calendar year. Um, the program year starts uh, July 1st and runs through June 30th. And so um, the activities and funding that we're going to be referring to is going to kick off um, July 1st of 2024 and run through June 30th of 2025. Um, and <laughs> the award amounts for 24-25 have not yet been released. Uh, so we're going to, for the purpose of our discussion and planning, um, we're going to um, use our current uh, funding amounts, funding allocations that we're receiving for uh, the current program year that we're in right now. And those are on your screen there for CDBG. Um, we're getting a little over, uh, well, 2.9 million there um, for home, uh, 1.7 million, and then for ESG, a little over 255,000 uh, for ESG right now. And just as a caveat for the purposes of discussion, we tend to get this question in every single district advisory board. So I just want to point it out. These, we can't take funds from one pot and use it for eligible uses in another grant. So these are prescribed by HUD and can't be changed. We're expecting ESG to stay about the same. We're expecting CDBG to be about the same. And we're expecting a slight cut to home. 
um, but we don't have our funding or official allocations yet for the purposes of pondering and discussion. All right, back to you, Ryan. And just as a reminder for CDBG, um, that stands for Community Development Block Grants, and it's used for a wide range of community development needs. And you see on the slide there, public facilities and improvements, housing, public services. And again, right now, um, currently a little over 2.9 million in CDBG, CDBG funding that we're currently receiving. In order for an activity to be um, eligible for CDBG, it must meet one of three national objectives. Uh, benefit low to moderate income individuals, uh, prevent slums or blights, and address urgent community needs. Uh, anytime we have um, an activity that we want to use CDBG funding for, we have to ensure that it isn't for an eligible spending activity. Um, so there's obviously we have to do our due diligence there and look and to ensure that that is eligible. Um, not less than 70% of spending must benefit low to moderate income persons. Um, and public services, which um, Erica kind of touched on, and I'm gonna to touch on even more here in a few slides. Um, for the city, we're typically traditionally uh, public services heavy. Uh, approximately 30% of our award is geared towards public services. Um, there is normally a public service cap of 15%. Um, however, here at the city, we are actually grandfathered in at a little over $1.1 million annually. Um, so we have a lot of public services dollars to spend. And as Erica said, that's um, uh, about one of the competitive uh, aspects of the CDBG that we have right now. Um, starting with infrastructure projects. Um, we're looking to allocate $319,270 from prior year resources. And um, just to kind of give you a heads up on that prior year, that's that's funding that's carried over uh, from a previous program year into the current consolidated plan period. Um, and this is going to be for um, earmarked towards infrastructure projects that can include park improvements, uh, bus shelters, sidewalks, street paving and or stormwater sewer drainage projects. Uh, we have demolition and clearance. Um, total looking that we're looking to allocate towards that in the upcoming program year is $50,000. Um, and that's funding that's going to be used for the demolition and clearance of blighted structures. We have a uh, MOU with uh, MABC, or Metropolitan Area Building and Construction Development. Um, their staff cites these blighted structures and they um, use this funding for the demolition and clearance of those uh, structures. Uh, next is our multi-agency center, or as a lot of you may have heard, uh, been referring it to as the MAC. Um, we're going to, we're looking to allocate um, Section 108 loan proceeds in the amount of $620,925. And these are special CDBG funds that were left over from prior a prior project that we're going to be using for this. Um, basically, it's, it's to acquire a public facility or the multi-agency center, and it's going to go towards um, providing um, all-inclusive homeless uh, services here in Wichita. Next, we have um, one of our most popular programs in our in-house, and that's home repair. Um, we're looking to allocate a um, little over $1.1 million for home repair. And you can kind of see how that breaks down below um, for the project funds. It's $710,223. And for program delivery, uh, $460,000. Uh, CDBG acquisition, disposition, and rehabilitation. Um, again, these are going to be prior year resources that are going to be allocated for this uh, particular project in the amount of $377,427. Um, this is funding that was previously allocated to the Wichita Land Bank. It's going to be carried forward into uh, this next uh, program year. Basically, it's going to be funding that's going to be used to support acquisition, uh, disposition, holding costs, rehabilitation, uh, demolition clearance of real land, um, our land of real property. Basically, the end, the end goal is to use this land or real property for affordable housing development, which our community desperately needs. So we do that. 
and CDBG administration. Um, we have a, a cap of 20% um, of funding that can be used towards administration. Um, we're looking to allocate $595,883. And you can see how that breaks down below for the uh, program management and fair housing, uh, $488,028. And then indirect costs, um, well over $107,000 there. And back to the public services that we had mentioned earlier. Um, like I said, we're grandfathered in at that amount of one, uh, $1,163,310. And you can kind of see how that breaks down again uh, below, a little over 103,000 going towards the Housing First uh, program delivery. Uh, Subrecipient public services, $475,000 via RFP. And Erica kind of touched on this earlier. This is the uh, this is the funds that actually go out um, via RFP. Um, people at uh, different agencies can submit applications for this funding. Uh, in the past, uh, we have sent uh, the RFPs for this chunk of funding uh, specifically for uh, domestic violence shelter services and youth crime prevention and enrichment activities. Um, however, uh, back in the fall, based off just the um, the, the comments and the uh, feedback we were getting from the community. And um, we've actually decided to open that up as a general RFP uh, this time around. Um, that way um, agencies um, that are offering different public services can apply um, for that as well. It's kind of open up um, different services, potentially open up different services in the community. Um, and these can be things like, um, you know, use services that we just mentioned, domestic violence, shelter services, um, employment, workforce services, uh, homelessness. Um, there's a, a, wide range, a wide range of activity services that this can go for. And so, like I said, that general RFP um, will be coming out soon. And then we have the Way to Work program, uh, $200,000 is geared towards that. And that's our um, youth employment program that we offer every summer. We call it the TWTW program. And again, $200,000 is being allocated towards that. And then lastly, the Office of Community Services, uh, 385,000. This helps uh, with the uh, fund that the Office of Community Services, that's your um, Atwater, Evergreen, and uh, Colvin um, centers there. And then I'm gonna kick it back over to Logan. So you wanna talk about home and MSG. Sure, thanks, Ryan. Um, Faith, to answer your question, in the actual plan document, you can see the proposed funding level by goal. That actually starts on page 104 of the plan document. Um, now, this is going to give you a five-year overlook by goal. So, you're not looking at funding allocations for a specific program year. We're looking at what we currently anticipate allocating over the course of the five-year period, we're not locked into these amounts. This is just what we are projecting currently. Um, it also breaks it down by annual action plan goal and the annual plan section, which is what I'm going to cover um, in, in these slides. So um, like Erica mentioned, the home grant is all about creating affordable housing opportunities for low to moderate income households. This is probably obvious from our presentation, but all of these programs are capped at at or below 80% of area median income. So for example, under the current income limit, in order for a family of four to be able to take advantage of programming that is provided for low to moderate income persons, either through home or through CDBG, um, that family cannot make more than $68,100 to give you just a frame of reference. That, um, those income limits are based on household size, um, and so it's not going to be the same for every single household. Um, and we have a grid on our website that kind of breaks down what that looks like, and I believe that's also referenced in the plan document as well. Um, moving on for specific funding allocations for home, again, we anticipate having right around or maybe just shy of $1.7 million to allocate for home in the um, upcoming annual plan year, we are proposing to take 10% off of the top to help us administer and stay in compliance with federal regulations. 
indirect charges, just as a high level overview for those who might not know, that is a fee that is levied by the city to pay internal service departments such as finance, information technology for the share of costs that are incurred for them to provide us internal services. Human resources would also be included in that as well. That indirect um, cost rate varies per year. Um, and so, but as a general rule of thumb for each grant, like Ryan mentioned, 20% of CDBG can be used for administration, 10% of home can be used for administration, and then the other grant that I'll talk about is ESG, and that's actually only capped at 7.5% of the grant. Um, moving on to the next program under home, home, home ownership AD down payment assistance. This is to create those affordable home ownership opportunities for low to moderate income families within the city. Um, and so that would be a program that could provide down payment and closing cost assistance to help a family be able to become homeowners, first time home homeowners. The program at the bottom of the slide, our TBRA program or tenant-based rental assistance. This is something that's new to our department, um, but is, is fairly common um, across the country. So this is a program that we are proposing to be uh, carried out with home funds that would specifically provide security deposit assistance to homeless people who are utilizing rental assistance programming that's administered within our department. So that could be our Section 8 program. Homeless individuals that are receiving vouchers could receive assistance with their security deposit. What we find um, and what we learned in the consultations as well, but we also experience this firsthand because we do administer those rental assistance programs in-house, is that oftentimes it's extremely difficult for a homeless person to pay application fees and security deposits. Unfortunately, um, that could be their only barrier to be able to utilize the rental assistance that they're receiving through either our Housing First program or our Rapid Rehousing program or our Section 8 program. And so this program could reduce that barrier and help that homeless individual and or family um, to be able to access housing uh, quicker to reduce homelessness within our community, which was a huge priority that we learned, um, a priority need in our community through the consultation process. Unfortunately, tenant screening fees or application fees are not an eligible use of home dollars. And so that's why we're proposing a security deposit only assistance program. Uh, next slide, please. Next, we'll talk about our housing development loan program funding um, and our community housing development organization or what we call CHOTO set aside. So this is funding that can be accessed by either for-profit or nonprofit developers to develop or rehabilitate affordable housing. This can be affordable housing for home ownership opportunities, or it can be affordable housing for rental opportunities. It can be affordable housing that's accessible to people who need to rent, and that can also be affordable housing uh, that creates home ownership opportunities. Um, additionally, this can be single family housing, this could be multifamily housing. So this program really kind of spreads the gamut. Um, we are required by home regulations to ensure that 15% of our annual home award, so 15% of that $1.7 million approximately, goes towards community housing development organizations or CHODOs. And I'll talk a little bit about what CHODOs are on, this ne on the next um, slide, but we're not quite there yet. And so what we are proposing is to manage the CHODO set-aside requirement through the Housing Development Loan Program or HDLP application process by giving a scoring preference to CHOTOs. Um, we consistently receive applications from CHOTOs for affordable housing development uh, pro projects. And so we do not anticipate an issue with, um, with allocating the required percentage. We've never had a problem with this in the past. Um, HDLP applications will be reviewed by the Affordable Housing Review Board before going to City Council for ultimate consideration. Next slide. These are the requirements to um, be a CHODO. I would say the um, 
we have a couple active children's in Wichita. Mennonite Housing is one. Jacob's Ladder is another. We have a chodo that's not currently active, but has done a substantial amount of work and really transformed the landscape of Northeast Wichita with affordable housing opportunities. That would be Power CDC. Habitat for Humanity is another nonprofit developer that we work with a lot. They are not a chodo because their board does not um, meet the requirement. So you have to have community representation from low income communities, which is the issue with Habitat otherwise they would um, meet all of the other requirements. But um, those are just some examples of nonprofit developers. And then this gives you an idea of what, um, what it takes to be a CHOTO. Next slide, I believe we're gonna be moving on to emergency solutions grant. So as you can see, $255,000 is the grant that we receive from the federal government to be able to address homelessness in our community. Um, the, the amount of, um, need that was presented in the consultation in phase one of the process related to homelessness is not proportionate to the number of dollars that we get. And so um, it's important that, you know, Ryan mentioned that CDBG public service dollars can also be used to address homelessness, but this is the dedicated funding source that we currently re receive to um, address homelessness in our community. And it can be addressed in a variety of different ways with the grant. If you'll go to the next slide, it outlines the high level funding buckets within ESG that we currently um, fund and are currently going to be proposing to fund in the next five year period. So we can provide assistance for shelter operations. So that could be, you know, keeping the lights on at shelters, paying for staff for shelters. That can actually even include potentially making infrastructure improvements and building improvements at shelters. Um, it's important to note that federal regulations tell us you can only spend up to 60% and not $1 more of your ESG grant towards shelter services. The other um, funding bucket within ESG is homeless prevention. That's exactly what it sounds like. These are resources that are allocated to prevent someone from becoming homeless, can be used for rent or utility assistance. The last program bucket is rapid rehousing. This is providing very short term. We operate our program less than three months of assistance to help an individual um, who is literally homeless get into housing. So typically this program is benefiting individuals who might have had an episodic episode of homelessness, but that are literally homeless right now, who might have income, who might have a job, who might be able to pay for that ongoing themselves, but that these funds can come in and provide that temporary, uh, very temporary, like two and a half months is what we have our program at to get them into housing and to get them in housing quickly. Um, let's see. Okay, so these are the two aspects of ESG that we are proposing to take out through a request for proposal process. And like Ryan mentioned, and we are changing the RFP process for CDBG and what we would make funds available for. And we also have a change proposed for emergency solutions grant as well. Yes. So when we were going through the emergency solutions grant, um, excuse me, when we were going through phase one of the consolidated planning process, um, it was in the fall and there was a lot of discussion surrounding emergency winter shelter. Um, and it really, it became very apparent that our community doesn't have a dedicated funding source for emergency winter shelter operations, um, for the sustainability of emergency winter shelter operations. For the past several years, we have been utilizing COVID money, essentially, from a variety of different spots, whether that be from the CARES Act or the American Rescue Plan Act. We've been ut utilizing a variety of different temporary funding sources that the city does not have that revenue coming in guaranteed um, in the future. These are, these are short-term uh, funding sources. Once the dollars are gone, they're gone. And so um, what we're proposing is to set aside the maximum 60% of ESG funding for winter shelter operations specifically um, to be able to fund winter shelter for this winter as well as winter shelter for next winter. This, you know, plans could always change. You know, the best laid plans sometimes don't go the way that you originally intended, but it is our intention to make 60% of the award if 
you know, ratified by council, of course, available for winter shelter operations for this upcoming program year and then the second program year. And then to set the 60, uh, 60% in the last three years of the consolidated planning period um, for shelter operations at the multi-agency center. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about that. And I know that there was a question about this current year shelter operation. We can talk about that in the comments as well, because we, our department played a big role in administering the funding agreement for the past winter shelter. Um, so we can talk about that as well, but I'd like to get through the remainder of these slides first. All right, moving on to talk about homeless prevention. One thing that we have heard consistently is there needs to be more resources for homeless prevention. So every single year in the current five-year period that we're currently in, we made $38,000 available. We're proposing to make $50,000 available um, in the first program year action plan for the next five-year period. Next, please. Finally, obviously have that 7.5% uh, that we're going to be taking for program administration and direct charges. And then the remainder of the grant we're proposing to go towards rapid rehousing. Again, I've already described that for very short-term rental assistance to get a literally homeless person housed. Um, and then they'll have their own income to be able to support their housing costs moving forward. Um, this definitely took a cut um, as compared to what we've allocated in years previous. Um, but we're not as concerned with that because in the past, there have been um, uh, coming out of this pot of funding is also uh, funding for security deposits, which we're proposing to supplement with the home funding that we talked about a few slides back. So we anticipate that with this 32 uh, approximate thousand dollars, we'll still be able to serve about the same number of people um, that we have in years previous. Okay, let's see. So there's a couple of things that I'd like to talk about before kicking it back over to WFN. One thing that we um, we did not include in the PowerPoint for some reason, um, this is just literally because of error, but that is addressed in your agenda report, um, is a revision to our citizens participation plan. So this is the very last document. If you know, There's gonna be a link in a future slide. If you click on that, you can go to our citizen participation plan um, like I said, it's the very last document that's found on the last, let's see, about six pages of the uh, package for public comment. Um, a lot of what we're doing in the citizen participation plan, a lot of the proposed, the proposed revisions that we have are um, really clarif clarification. And additionally, there is a lot of conversation currently related to um, how the public is made aware of um, various city initiatives and so making sure that we're posting those things on our website and um yeah i think that's basic we're re-clarifying what um, constitutes the need for a substantial amendment we've updated a, a web we had our an old address in there for some reason we've updated that just trying to kind of clean up and tighten that document up a little bit um, but no, no major substantial changes, I would say, to that document, but it's something that we would like your feedback on. And the last thing I want to mention before kicking it over to WFN is those aspects that we are proposing to take out for RFP, so CDBG Public Services and Emergency Solutions Grant, specifically prevention here in the next, we're hoping to have the RFP issued very, very soon. Um, we're, so we need to solicit a grants review committee nominee from District Two. And so that's a member of the district advisory board that might be interested in serving on the review panel for that committee. I believe, Faith, you've served on that in the past, correct? Yes. Yeah. So Faith could probably tell you a little bit more about the ins and outs of it. Um, and we'd love to have any of you from District 2 um, serve on that committee as well. So now I'll kick it back over to Erica to cover, you know, what are our next steps and then also facilitate conversation and take your comment um, before we wrap it up. All right, I'm back. So um, kind of next steps in this process, uh, we'll give you just a, a list of uh, important dates and next steps that you all should be aware of um, in this process. So right now we're in... Uh, what's called a public comment period. Um, for HUD, it has to be at least uh, 30 days um, for the city of Wichita. 
we are a little bit longer than that 30 day um, time frame to accommodate all of the DAP meetings and um, the uh, city council meetings. So we're a little bit north of that 30 day requirement, um, which is not a bad thing. Um, so we are going to meet with all six of the DABs. You are the very first meeting that we've had. Um, so we'll have another meeting this evening with um, District 6. Uh, May 4th, we'll meet with District 3. And then on May 6th, we have a very heavy task of meeting with three uh, DAB groups, uh, one, four, and five on May 6th. Um, so we're looking forward to those. Um, and then we're going to come back out um, and do some um, community meetings. Um, so there are two scheduled right now um, via Zoom. So that's uh, April 22nd at 6 p.m. and then April 24th at 10 a.m. And these meetings are designed to give the general public an opportunity to uh, hear about the priorities and hear about the impediments and the recommendations. Um, it's an opportunity for us to hear about those things and then on May 13th, uh, we're going to have um, an in-person meeting at the Advanced Learning Library. So we'll be there on site um, to gather feedback and get input um, that way. And then on uh, the morning of May 14th, uh, we'll have a public hearing at the uh, at City Council. And then City Council will approve that, um, well, we'll seek approval. Um, they'll take a vote on that on May 14th. And then hopefully we will, by that time, have our award notification. If not, um, we're waiting for that. Um, as soon as that's available, the plan will be updated with those um, accurate numbers. And then uh, submission to HUD. So once the city is awarded or notified of what their uh, dollar amount will be, um, they have 60 days to get that plan um, approved, I'm sorry, submitted to HUD. So 60 days after the announcement of the allocation, um, the city has about, um, they have 60 days to get that submitted to HUD. And um, so we're looking forward to that. We'll go to the next slide. Sorry, Erica. I oh, lost sorry. It. I'll have to do it. Okay, no worries. I can see it here on my screen. Can you guys see my screen? We can. can try to share. Okay. okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, so for tonight for recommendations, um, it's recommended that um, the district advisory board provide comment. Um, we're also giving you other opportunities to make comment um, other than here tonight. Um, so you can email your comments to Andrew. Um, his email is located there, um, atyree at wichita.gov. Um, you can call via phone. Um, so you can call Andrew and provide that comment over the phone, or you can send a, a letter to Andrew um, using the address that's listed here. Um, the full plans are available at the link here um, on the city's website at the Housing and Community Services um, on their uh, page of the city's website. So if you want to download that, read through it, click through it, see all of the various research and that sort of thing, um, that's where you'll be able to find the document. Okay. And so you won't go to the next slide. What's there? That's it. Okay, that's the, that's the last slide. So at this time, we'll open it up for comments. Um, if anybody has any questions or you'd like to provide any comment about the um, priorities, about any of the activities or projects, um, we'll, we'll take that at this time. 